Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's get medieval. Welcome to a special feature of Book Central. You see, when I'm not reading or recording this podcast, I'm a medievalist. In the real world, I research and analyze medieval literature, specifically the texts written in Old Norse and Old English between the 7th and 14th centuries. Each month, I'm going to share one of my favorite medieval texts with you, either from these two languages or something completely different. As usual, I'll go over the happenings of the story and then discuss some of my favorite aspects of it. These episodes will also feature a bit more historical background, where necessary, and even my sometimes questionable pronunciation of medieval vernaculars. Today, we're talking about an Old English poem called The Dream of the Rood. That is its most common title, but it is sometimes also called A Vision of the Cross. The poem can be found in the Vercelli book, which is a 10th century medieval manuscript about which I'll tell you a little bit more later on. The Dream of the Rood is a fascinating poem because it tells the story of Jesus' crucifixion through the eyes of the cross, or the rood, itself. Even if you're not religious at all, this poem might still be interesting for you, even just to see how you could make a medieval warrior hero out of Jesus. And, as a little treat, Loki and Thor will pop up at the end of the episode as well. But before we get into all of that, Here is a taste of the first twenty odd lines in the Old English. Chwat ich swef na sist set shan wille. Chwat me je maate tu mitre nichte. Sith an reog berend reste wunedon. Tuchte me dat ich je save silich getreo on luft leden leochte bewunden. Be om be ochtost. Il dat bietchen was begotten mit golde. Jima stodun, je grad voll dan sheatum, zwilche dar vife waren, upe und am ergsle je spanne, behelden dar engel drichtnes eile, feire durch forth je scheeft, nevas dar huru frakodes je alga, ak hinne dar behelden halie gastas, men overmoldan, und eel deus mare je scheeft, silich basse sie bim, Und ich sinam fach, verwunden mit Wommum, je seach ich wulderes Dreo, weidum je weorthode, wünum schinan, je gieren mit Golde, jemals havdun bewriegene weorthliche, weildes Dreo. I am using Elaine Trahan's edition of the poem from her anthology Old and Middle English, circa 890 to circa 1400. I'm also going to give you her translation of the lines we just read. <clears throat> Listen, I will tell the best of visions that came to me in the middle of the night, when voice bearers dwelled in rest. It seemed to me that I saw a more wonderful tree lifted in the air wound round with lights, the brightest of beams. That beacon was entirely cased in gold. Beautiful gems stood at the corners of the earth, Likewise, there were five upon the crossbeam. All those fair through creation gazed on the angel of the Lord there. There were certainly no gallows of the wicked. But the Holy Spirits beheld it there, men over the earth and all this glorious creation. Wondrous was the victory tree, and I stained with sins, wounded with guilt. I saw the tree of glory, Honoured with garments, shining with joys, covered with gold, gems had covered magnificently the tree of the forest. Our poem starts with a narrator who is telling us about a dream he had. In this dream, or vision, he sees a wonderful tree covered in gems and beautiful to behold, while the narrator himself feels covered in sin. However, in between those beautiful gems, He starts to also see that the tree is stained with blood, and this frightens him. He keeps watching it, though, until the rood begins to speak. The rood remembers when it was but a young tree, 
ripped from its roots by strong enemies who told him he would only bear criminals on his shoulders. But then, as he's being made a spectacle of, the root suddenly sees the saviour come towards him, eager to climb up on him. And so, the root neither breaks nor bows and instead stands strong for the Yeung Haleth, the young hero who is Christ. Jesus is a warrior in this poem, who embraces the root and everything it means. The root is raised as a cross, and he thereby raises the kuning, or king, into the air. The root is pierced with nails, wounded by malice, but he does not injure the men back. He and Christ are mocked, and the root laments the cruelties of fate. But then darkness covers him and the ruler. Shadows creep forth, and all of creation weeps. Christ was on Rode. Christ was on the cross. Helpers arrive, and the root bows down so that they can release Christ from his torments. They leave the root behind, however, wounded and weary. He sees how they build Christ a tomb, but he himself is fell to the ground and buried. The root is eventually found by followers of Christ, however, and now he is adorned with silver and gold. The root tells that although he has experienced evil, he is now honoured across the world and is a beacon to believers. Christ suffered on him, but now he can show those who suffer the way. He asks the dreamer to tell what he has seen, to reveal the words of the tree of glory to others, as through the cross they will be saved. And so the dreamer prays, his spirit full of longing. He hopes the rude will save him from this short and transitory life and will bring him bliss and joy. Hope is renewed through the battle Christ fought on the cross and his harrowing of hell. And our narrator can now hope for eternal life in heaven. And that is the dream of the rude, although it's hard to do justice to just how beautiful it is in the Old English. As I mentioned at the beginning, the Dream of the Rood exists only in one manuscript, which means we only have one version of the poem. That's quite a difference from the text we discussed last month, Hof Saga Gautrexuna, of which 66 manuscripts exist. The one version of the Dream of the Rood is found in the Vercelli book, a manuscript codex of 135 leaves. The Vercelli book is dated to the second half of the 10th century, and scholars suspect that it comes from the southeast of England, potentially Canterbury. This manuscript contains 23 prose texts, interspersed with six poems, one of them the one we are talking about today, all of which were copied into the manuscript by a single scribe. Imagine the time that would have taken, the days, weeks, months, and more during which this one scribe would have sat at his little desk, scribbling away by candlelight. When it comes to medieval manuscripts, it's always interesting to consider how they would have been put together. Some manuscripts show a clear design. For example, a single dialect or writing style was chosen and used. The scribe of the Fricelli book, on the other hand, kind of retained the punctuation and dialect of each of the texts he copied from, which means the manuscript doesn't really read in a uniform way. Now, important note, while the scribe in the 10th century had exemplars, so texts from which he copied, we are now only have the Fricelli book. What he copied from has been lost, but we can kind of guesstimate that some probably were written down a lot earlier than the 10th century. Although there may be no formal arrangement of the texts and no uniform approach, each of the texts in the Fercelli book does contain a monastic or religious theme, which suggests that the compiler might have wanted to demonstrate the worthiness of their own religious, ascetic life. You might ask yourself now why a manuscript codex written in the south of England in Old English is called the Fercelli book. We're not entirely sure how this manuscript ended up in Fricelli, which is a city in northern Italy, not too far away from Milan. It was probably already there in the 12th century, but we don't know who brought it there, whether it was a gift, etc. It was only rediscovered in the Fricelli library in the 19th century, where it had been gathering dust in all the previous centuries. Thankfully, now a large part of it is digitized, so you can see it online at the Old English Poetry in Facsimile project, to which I'll link in the description. 
While Beowulf was my first and my most long-lasting Old English crush, The Dream of the Root quickly became something of a favorite for me as well. It became a favorite to such an extent that I wrote an entire BA thesis about it. But I, I won't read out my entire thesis to you, don't worry. I do just want to mention one or two things, though, as I'm sure you can imagine. In order to do that, I need to introduce you to a term. And that term is syncretism. Syncretism refers to the combining or mingling of different schools of thought and is most frequently used in reference to the active melding together of two religions. While this activity has a very long history, it is especially notable in the initial spread of Christianity in the Middle Ages. By combining elements of the pre-established mythology with elements of the new faith, These missionaries uh, in the Middle Ages attempted to kind of smooth out the conversion process and not raise too many pagan hackles along the way. This, of course, wasn't universally successful. Anglo-Saxon England was converted to Christianity during the 7th century, triggered by a Gregorian mission in 597. The first king to accept baptism was Ertelberg of Kent, circa 601, while the first Anglo-Saxon to become Archbishop of Canterbury was a dude called Deus Dedit in 655. Conversion is a process, not a one-time thing. If a king becomes Christian, his people technically do as well, but just because something is proclaimed doesn't mean it actually happens. Conversion takes time, as traditions change and stories begin to adapt. Old English literature dates roughly from the 7th century, when conversion began, to the 11th century, specifically kind of 1066 as a cutoff point, when the Norman invasion produced such a strong cultural shift that Middle English came about and different kinds of genres and texts were written. So in the Old English literature we have, we can see glimpses of these Anglo-Saxons trying to work out how their previous beliefs fit into Christianity. And this brings us back to the dream of the rude. First, some basic facts. The poem is written in alliterative verse, meaning that there is alliteration within the lines of the poems. For example, in the fifth line, on Luft Leoden, Leorte Bewunden, you can see the alliteration with the letter L, which binds together the ideas of the cross being lifted in the air, Lift, and it being adorned with Leorte, light. Old English poetry is also very fond of kennings, which are figures of speech, which we also find in Old Norse poetry, in which figurative language is kind of used to describe something else. It's like using a very fancy way of saying something basic. An example of this is in the fourth line, where the poem speaks of reorbeerend, which means voice bearers. The poem is talking about men, sleeping, but rather than just use men, the poem uses reorbeerend to kind of adorn the poem and to allow for alliteration on the letter R within that line. Old English poetry also usually has a pause known as a cesura in the middle of a line, which I've kind of tried to emphasize in some of the line readings at the beginning. The alliteration then unites these two halves of the line together, tying the different things being mentioned or discussed into a cohesive whole. As you may be also noticed, the poem can kind of be divided into three different sections. The beginning, where we hear about the dreamer, the middle, where the cross tells us a story, and the end, where the dreamer kind of hopes and prays for a better future. Scholars have argued extensively, as they're wont to do, about these sections, what they mean, and what falls into which section. I think I agree with Del Mastro, who suggests that they're not so much sections as concentric circles. Think of the dreamer as the circle on the outer edge, with the story of the rude as the one closer to the center, and the story of Christ himself at the very center of the poem. As we go through the poem, we travel into these circles and then back out of them again. First we hear from the dreamer, then from the cross, then we hear about Christ, then we go back to the cross, and then we end up with the dreamer again. I like this idea of concentric circles, I think, because it fits the way the poem flows in the Old English. Also, dream narratives were incredibly popular as a frame device during the Middle Ages, with some of the most famous texts like Roman de la Rose using it as well. These dream narratives are often used to provide a little bit of distance to the subject material, 
to make people a little more receptive to what they're about to be told. Remember Carmilla two weeks ago? There, a frame device was used, namely the finding of a manuscript, to make readers a little more receptive to a story about vampires. In the case of The Dream of the Root, a dream narrative is used to make the audience a little more receptive to the themes of the poem, rather than being turned off by the idea of a talking cross. I tried to sprinkle some of the Old English through the summary above, especially where it refers to Christ. The bachelor thesis that I wrote inspired by this poem was about how these pagan and Christian, and maybe pagan's even the wrong word, how these heroic and Christian elements come together in the poem, and you see that nowhere more clearly than in the depiction of Christ. He is called Yeung Haleth, young hero, Kuning, king, Beo, warrior, and Weildend, ruler. In the dream of the rood, Christ eagerly climbs the cross, and we are told he is modig on manige jesichte, da he wolde man kun lusan. He is brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. Christ is a man on a mission, a hero willing to give his last breath in order to save his people. When later, after his resurrection, he undertakes the harrowing of hell, the poem speaks of how he will lead with many, an army or a troop of souls, and how he will be victorious. Add to that the constant reminder of the blood he is shedding and which the cross is kind of covered in, and we have something kind of gory and heroic, which maybe doesn't fit into many modern churches. And this is syncretism at work. The heroic ethos of the Anglo-Saxons, which often put an emphasis on that mix between tragedy and glory, was one in which heroes fought alongside each other with loyalty, in which they did not flinch away from their enemies and did not avoid death. How do you best combine that with a religious figure who also dies tragically on a cross, seemingly betrayed and abandoned by all? You give him a loyal retainer in the form of the cross, a young tree ripped from all he knows, but purified and saved by the battle he fights alongside his Lord. Jesus still dies, but he does so as a hero, bound to rise again for another battle. The story of the crucifixion is here adapted to a previously non-Christian culture, with martial language, plenty of blood, and victory and hope in the end. I don't want to overemphasize the blood and gore, because this poem is not just a fun adaptation, but there's some real like theological work taking place. The poets who crafted this poem and the scribe who put it down in the Vercelli book all found some kind of solace in these words. While the Middle Ages weren't as grey, depressing and unhygienic as popular culture will have you believe, they also weren't a cakewalk. There was a lot of conflict between different peoples, something with which the Anglo-Saxons had a lot of experience. They themselves only invaded Britain in the 4th and 5th centuries, only to then be plagued by Vikings from the 8th century onwards and to then be defeated by the Normans in the 11th. In a time of difficulty, where you're facing internal strife, warfare, potentially disease and all kinds of other things, which I think we can maybe relate to a little now, a poem like The Dream of the Rood which tells you that despite the hardship and the suffering you're going through now, something good and beautiful might be waiting for you, is incredibly encouraging. But I mentioned the Vikings there, and there are two final kind of medieval things I want to bring to your attention which link to this poem. Yes, they also just happen to be two crosses. The first is the Ruthwell, or perhaps Ruthwell, cross, which, as the name suggests, stands in the village of Ruthwell, which now lies in Scotland, but was part of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria in the Middle Ages. The cross is five and a half meters high and is one of the most elaborate Anglo-Saxon sculptures that we still have. It dates to the 8th century and, because it also has Old English writing on it, contains the oldest surviving Old English text we have. The text is poetry, written in a runic alphabet, and it contains lines that are incredibly similar to those we find in The Dream of the Rood. These lines might have been added later, so maybe after the 8th century, but we're not entirely sure. The cross also shows relief carvings of Christ and several other figures, including Mary Magdalene and potentially John the Baptist. Unfortunately, the Ruthwell cross was smashed by some Presbyterian iconoclasts in the 17th century, 
But thankfully, the pieces were then just kind of left and abandoned, and it could be re-erected and pieced back together later. The other cross I want to mention is the Gosford Cross, about which, I have to admit, I may have also written something in the past. This one can be found in Gosforth, Big Shock, which is now in Cumbria, which was also formerly part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. This part of England was settled by the Vikings in the 9th or 10th centuries, and the Gosforth Cross is a perfect example of syncretism at work, just like the Dream of the Rood. Where the poem tries to bring together Christianity with Anglo-Saxon heroic culture, the Gosforth Cross is an attempt by Northumbrians to bring together Anglo-Saxon Christianity and Norse mythology. See, Christianity didn't really arrive in the North until the 11th century, which means like three, four centuries after England. And this means that when the Vikings arrived in Britain in the 9th century, they were absolutely not Christians. They might have heard of Christianity before, but they were not practicing that. As they settled into Britain, however, Vikings mixed with the locals and would have picked up some of their ideas and habits as well. The Gosforth Cross shows how this might have worked. The cross is a little over four meters tall, and the bottom of it has this ring chain motif, which makes it look like tree bark. This could be Yggdrasidl, the world tree, perhaps. You can't help but wonder. Or maybe it's a tree of life from the Bible. From there, it gets a little bit weirder, though. About halfway up the cross, a little above your normal kind of eyesight, there is a crucifixion scene, which will probably strike most of us as being very Christian. But there is a woman pictured below him who looks just like the Valkyries do on some Viking Age carvings discovered in Sweden. Could it perhaps be not Christ, but the god Baldr, whose death starts Ragnarök before he is reborn in the New World? Perhaps you're thinking, nah, that's definitely Christ. But what about Fenris Wolf fighting the god Vidar on the other side of the cross? And what about Loki bound in chains made of guts and intestines? And what about Thor trying to catch Jormungarder, the mid-god serpent, all of which is shown on this cross as well? All of that on a four-meter cross smack bam in the middle of a cemetery next to a lovely little church in Cumbria. While we don't know who made these two crosses, even if we might have something of an idea of a sculptor who was very prolific in Northumbria, and while also we don't really know who first thought up the dream of the rood, they're both excellent and fascinating little insights into the minds of people who lived hundreds of years ago. The people of the Middle Ages weren't necessarily some super fanatical followers of Christ who mindlessly accepted everything they were told was in the Bible. They heard the stories, they thought about them deeply, adapted them to suit their own culture, and perhaps gained some solace out of them in difficult times. And perhaps some of them thought that it would also be quite funny to have Jesus next to Loki on a cross. What can I say? Even people in the Middle Ages had a sense of humor. I was raised Christian, and would still call myself one, even if my faith is pretty unorganized and personal. But the dream of the root speaks to that part of me. But it also speaks to my love for the heroes of old, for their loyalty and endurance, and to my love for the beauty of language. I hope you'll get something out of the Dream of the Root and the Gosforth and Rothwell Cross as well, even if it's just a small insight into how Anglo-Saxons thought about their religion. If you're interested in seeing more of either of these things, have a look at the description. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to... Look central.